Welcome to the Cougar Tailgate, where BYU fandom lives. Here's your hosts, Sydney Carlson and Cole Wissinger. Good afternoon, Cougar fans. Welcome back into the Cougar Tailgate. And this week, no preamble. We just got to get right to it. There was one moment that captured this week, and we got to talk about it. TJ Selyus, handoff, Toulson, 25 feet away, right side to TJ, left side, down to 10. TJ, pull up three. He oh! got it! He got it! No threes, TJ no threes. Haas scores it! Timeout! Timeout! <laughs> TJ Haas gives the Cougars a two-point lead. 81-79. to He's stuck it in there. game winner against St. Mary's for T.J. Haas, his how many game winner? I mean, at least, you know, you have the Houston (laughs) dramatics. Right. This felt so much better because it's St. Mary's, because it's in conference, and because we needed this one. Oh, needed it so badly. And I got to tell you, there is no substitute for a packed Marriott Center. I don't – it's hard to describe the high – that was like emanating through that building after t- t- or TJ hit that three pointer. The place was buzzing, like you could feel the floor moving, and it was just people screaming. And uh, we talked about it last week, just saying like it's a great game, like it's a perfect opportunity to come and be loud. And Cougar Nation showed up, and I honestly don't think we win that game if we don't have a crowd that we did. And it helps when your team is uh, putting on a show on the floor. It oh, helps yes. get the, the crowd hop- hyped up, but you got to have like a give and take. Like the team is putting up shots, gets the crowd hyped, and that, when the crowd's hyped, the team's putting up shots. You go back and forth, and it it was a completely different atmosphere than we've had any other game this year. I'm going to give us at least all of the credit for how many people showed up. Absolutely. I'm just going to assume that everyone heard <laughs> us say, hey, uh, probably come to this one. It's going to be good. And then they did. It, and it, it did make a difference. Later on today, um, we're going to play an interview where I got to talk to Zach Selyus. And I asked him because, uh, I don't know, sometimes I think fans – these are these are real athletes, right? And fans <laughs> sure. can think maybe that they're more important than they are. But I, so I asked him, like, "Hey, you're on the court. Does it act? Does it really? Does it really make a difference whenever someone is loud?" And he said, "Absolutely." And especially for him on offense, because it just gets you into that groove. Anyone that's played backyard basketball knows that it's very easy to like slip in and out of shooting. And so when you have people hyping you up, you feel more confident, and you can go out there and get it done. That is what happened against a very good St. Mary's team. And if oh, there's just a, a feeling that comes with beating a St. Mary's or a Gonzaga that is different than any other game. You love to win the other games, but this one felt really good. And it was a hard-fought battle. There was a section there where, in fact, I've got a group chat when we're at the games. There's a group chat with our athletic department like section. Yeah, <laughs> And probably, I don't know, three minutes out from the end of the game just despair complete despair Mm -hmm. uh and then BYU goes on a run ties it up place gets so loud and suddenly we're back in it and those are the sweetest wins to me are the ones that are hard fought and well earned and it was a really great game yeah I mean St. Mary's hit their largest lead of the game there like in the back half of that second half and it it was starting to feel like it was pulling away and, and that people, he was grasping at things. And then right there were some, we got to run key missed rebounds at the end of the game that I thought were going to do us in. It was the difference between like a 75, 76 with a minute and a half left, but instead we missed a rebound and they get a three point shot. And then it's 75, 79. And I was like, that's it. That's it. And we then, got this. and then, then we got this. the heavens TJ. opened and the angels sang. <laughs> Not to mention the, uh, the just in general life night that TJ Haas had. It seems like right. it's been forever That's ago, right. but the man leaves the biggest shot of his life, mm-hmm. I think that I will say, to go and like watch the birth his of his child being fir- born. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 100%. That that does not get better just from a a person standpoint. Absolutely. And his brother Tyler has been at a bunch of games with uh his his baby and that's fun too to see. You know, it's a family affair in the Haas family. Support. 
That's BYU basketball. That's BYU sports for you. We love it. My, you mentioned your group chat. Uh, my group chat is normally dead silent in BYU <laughs> games because we all stream at different. Like oh. my group chat is <laughs> consists of dudes from DC, Houston, Salt Lake, me, yeah, somewhere else, and so we're all streaming at different times on different platforms. So and you so don't you don't it. say anything. That's so funny. Until five minutes after the game is done. And then we all talk about what just happened. That oh, because you, you you can't spoil a thing. No, no. When you're why watching live you? sports, that was one struggle I had when I interned um, back in college with Greg Rubel, mm-hmm. and he was up at KSL. Done that gig as well. A hundred percent. And you hear what happens before you see what happens. It's not my favorite experience watching sports. I've got to say, well, the worst experience I had as an intern. <laughs> with Greg Rubel. <laughs> Overall, 10 out of 10 would recommend. Oh, yes. But there was one game. We happened to be playing a certain team called Texas on the road. Uh, yeah. And it was my turn as the intern to uh, go get dinner for everybody because we would take turns like going out, right? Mm-hmm. The most boring game. So I was like, I got it. I got it, guys. I'll go get Panda Express. Sure. I come back and I was like, sarcastically, did I miss anything? Uh. Anything good happen? And they all looked at me <laughs> like they were about to tell me that someone had died. Yeah. And they were like, you just missed the most amazing touchdown. Like, Taysom just hurtled over some dude. And I'm wait, like, wait, wait, you wait. are so, <laughs> lying to me. I was so upset. Because I remember when I, where I was at when that happened. Yeah. Uh, I can tell you I was at the gateway were... <laughs> picking up Panda Express for the other Greg Rebell interns. <laughs> even, even from this broadcast building right here, when we're broadcasting the game on radio, we just will pull it up on TV as well. Mm-hmm. And so you hear Greg Rebell say something, and then it's seven seconds later or right, whatever you got it that is. Delay. that we actually see it happen on TV, which, it, it, honestly, it's beneficial whenever Greg's complaining about foul because we don't have to wait for the replay. We hear him say, oh, that should have been you know, something, something. Oh, that's nice. And then we can, oh, yeah, that he, he's got a point there. <laughs> so BYU, coming off of St. Mary's, this, this boosts everything, right? When we look at the rankings of where BYU sits, I think we can credit a lot of it to actually coming through, doing what you're supposed to do, win at home. And all of a sudden, BYU sees itself number 15 in the Ken Palm. They are a seven seed in Joe Lenardi's. They are getting votes in the AP Top 25, despite right. the Associated Press being very Eastern biased. <laughs> the coastal elites. Ugh, can't stand them <laughs> sitting in the Mountain West area of things, Intermountain West. But, but BYU is getting some national attention. And that's, that's important. That's good. Yeah, it's huge. I mean... I've mentioned it many times. I would love for this to be the year, finally, where we aren't stressing all the time about are we in, are we out, are we bubble, are we not? Like, I don't want to be a bubble team anymore. I'm tired of being a bubble team. And I think this team is talented enough to solidly make it in and do some good work in the tournament, honestly. We just have to take care of <laughs> the remainder of the schedule. Remember last week we talked about just some of the like weird losses that seem to crop up every single mm-hmm. year? After a St. Mary's, I think the uh, the overused term is a trap game, right? Sure, and, sure. And BYU has dropped one of these every dang year that Great. you just shouldn't. But against Portland... They stayed sharp. Toulson right side. 90 seconds to go till the break. Jake on the bump. Steps back on Ferenson. Shoots over him and scores it again! Jake Toulson is feeling it! The step back bomb from the top of the key. He's got 12 and the Cougars lead by 11 just that quickly. In a game that BYU could have very easily dropped and in past years has had at least one of these where against that bottom tier of the WCC something slips up. You win by 30, and you relax a little bit. Because why have we been on the bubble every single year? Because you can't get through the games in the WCC that you have to. So far, so far, be what you have. Yeah, knock on wood. Uh, One thing we didn't talk about in the St. Mary's game that I think is crucial when you look at Portland is Jake Toulson going down in the first half just in what seemed to be agonizing pain. Oh my goodness, yeah. I thought for sure it's an ACL. We've lost him for the rest of the season. That is such a huge crushing blow. And once again, one of my coworkers chats, he suddenly texts me, he goes, wait, wait, Jake's on the bench. Hold on, he's on the bike? Like he's riding the bike. And now he's subbing in. Like it was like this like panic moment where we're like, what is happening? 
what is happening? He's okay. Someone keep he's not track only okay, he's on the court. And then you look at what he did at Portland, putting up 22 points. And I think, like, you just, you have to, like, breathe a sigh of relief because we almost, I mean, I just, he's been such a key player on this team. And to lose him and you don't have Baxter in and, you know, Yoli. Although that might, that might change. Be that might change. <laughs> but just looking at the players that we have been out this year, somehow they've managed to pull out some kind of miraculous moments and turnarounds and being without Yoli as much as we have been. And the other guy that scored 22 against Portland. Right, right. <laughs> and I don't know if we would have. I don't. That's maybe, maybe I'm pessimistic. That if they're right. not playing. Maybe if I maybe I'm pessimistic, but I just don't know if we had lost Jake if we would have like how many how many things can you overcome <laughs> before yes. it becomes just too much. So, I yeah, that was huge to be that Jake was luckily okay and okay enough to come and be a <laughs> top scorer against Portland. Jake also puts up six three point out of those 18 points. Or 22 points, 18 came just from behind the three-point arc. Yeah, no big So deal. to have a reliable three-point presence, I think, has been very important to BYU. Absolutely. It just always. Oh, BYU has always lived and died by the three. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's good to have Jake, um, who's pretty consistent there. He'll, you know, everyone has their off nights. But Jake has really crushed it behind the arc this year. And we talk about streaks, right? And, and basketball is a game of runs, as happens. And and we've talked about BYU, you know, they managed to overcome one against St. Mary's, but against the, the other teams in the conference, how sometimes you go on one of these runs to start the second half, BYU had one of these, where for the first, for over half of the second half, if, if it was in quarters, it would have been a quarter, but it was half of a half, uh, the Pilots only scored five points in the wow. first chunk, and that those are the kind of runs that keep BYU ahead and that kind of assert the dominance and that kind of put put away the teams that you need to. Right. Well, and we've talked before about um, ESPN's, like, probability win percentage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. BYU in this Portland game never dipped below 90%. And from the, second, from the beginning of the second half to the end of the game— it was 98 and then 99.9 for like the last 15 minutes of the game. And it just kind of sits at the top of the graph. <laughs> like, yeah, like Portland does not want to be in this game. Like that is just, that is crushing to be on the receiving end of like such a dominating like loss for Portland. I don't know how you, how you could like at some point you just, you just deflate and you're like, what, what am I even doing here? Yeah. Those, those poor Portland players, but it's. It's exciting to see that, like you said, we're not dropping those trap games and that hopefully I think what needs to happen is that the games not against Gonzaga that we have the rest of the year that you take care of in this fashion. Like you have the talent, you have the ability, you have to go out and put up these numbers. They don't have to necessarily be 30 point wins every time, but like a solid 10 point victory at least would be great. Yes. And it starts, well, uh, we have the middle of it, right? So we had St. Mary's last week, San Francisco tonight, right. and then Gonzaga coming up again at the Marriott Center. At the Marriott Center. Show up. There it is. You've had had you've had your call to action, folks. Be there. We've seen it make a difference against St. Mary's. And San Francisco, not the, not the bottom tier that I think just not being St. Mary's or Gonzaga kind of puts it in people's minds because right. BYU has lost now three straight against San Francisco. They lost both of them last right. year, one real tough one earlier this year. And so you need to come back around and, again, take care of business until Gonzaga time. Right. It's a team that's proved um, time and time again that they can compete with BYU and have put up some heartbreaking losses against us. In fact, uh, I... You talked to Zach Selius, I talked to the AD at LMU, and he brought up San Francisco and mentioned that they're kind of the team to look out for right now, maybe a little bit of a dark horse. So you have to, you cannot count them out. This cannot be your track trap game. You're feeling great after St. Mary's in Portland, but you cannot count this team out, especially after they were able to shut it down in San Francisco. So show them that this is your house and take care of business. doesn't change win or lose right every day we have to become a better team it's what we have to do and in terms of our belief 
I think it helps us in terms of our trusting, just fighting one more possession. I think it helps us in terms of guys trusting each other. I think it helps us, and those things are important, man. They make the difference. We're we're now officially in the dog days of February. The next game we have is going to be harder than this. I guarantee it. And it's going to be just as hard to win, and that's just how it's how it works in February. And so we got to keep getting better. San Francisco is on the schedule for tonight and next Thursday. BYU will make the trip to sunny Southern California against LMU. When we come back, Cindy Carlson will have a conversation with their athletic director, Craig Pittens. That's coming up next. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to the Cougar Tailgate. This is Sydney Carlson, and I am here with Craig Pintins from LMU. He's the AD. We're bringing in a little help as we look ahead to the LMU game. Craig, tell us a little bit about your background and how long you've been at LMU. Sure. Well, first of all, thanks for having me on, Sydney. Appreciate it. Uh, I've, I've been at LMU now for about a year and a half. I came from the University of Oregon. Previous to that, I was at LSU. I've been at Marquette, at Texas Pan American, which is no longer in existence. Actually, they changed the name of it, but no longer in existence. So I've, I've kind of seen a little bit of everything and, and been a little bit of everywhere. Yeah, wow, you've been all over the country. One thing we like to do on the program is kind of talk about what makes each program unique. So obviously, you've been to a lot of different programs. You've seen a lot of different things. What is it that makes LMU's program different and unique? Well, I, I think we have built-in advantages that other schools in the conference don't have. Uh, number one, we're located in the beautiful city of Los Angeles. We have amazing weather. We have a beautiful campus. Uh, and, and those are things that you cannot replicate. And, and obviously, if, as you go around the WCC, it, it is a, a, a conference that has a lot of beautiful campuses. So that doesn't necessarily make us unique. But I've been to them all, and, and I like ours the best in terms of, of beauty. I hear that. I used to live probably about five minutes from LMU. For those that may be... Uh, traveling to the game. Talk to us about some things that they maybe should go see or like your favorite beaches nearby. Absolutely. Well, the great thing is we're we're 10 minutes away from LAX, so fly right into LAX. And it, I think LA obviously has a reputation for traffic, but we are legitimately 10 minutes away from the airport because the way you, you go, there's not a lot of traffic. But there's a, so much to do, obviously, in Los Angeles. We're very close to Santa Monica, very close to Manhattan Beach. Obviously, great restaurants in, in both of those spots, as well as great beaches and great piers. So those are probably some things to do. But encourage people to just walk around our campus, walk out to the bluff. Uh, you can see where Howard Hughes Aviation used to be, which is right below us, below the bluff. And now it's Playa Vista, which has been totally built up. So just a beautiful spot to, to come uh, if you're coming out to the game. And, and we know we'll have a lot of BYU fans there. We We love playing BYU in any sport because we know – that the Cougars are going to be there. We do travel pretty well. Um, what are some of the other sports that you personally like going to at LMU? Well, I, I, I like whatever events I'm at, uh, first and foremost, because obviously when you have 22 sports, you, you try to get to as many as you can. But uh, we're looking forward to the spring. It should be a, a great spring for us. Baseball should be pretty, pretty good. Uh, and we're looking forward to that, as well as beach volleyball and beach Volleyball is a, a fun sport to watch. We're, again, located pretty close to the beach. We're only a mile and a half from the beach, so it, it seems natural that we should be uh, good at beach volleyball. Yeah, it's definitely an advantage you guys have in L.A. We we uh, can't play beach volleyball where we're at. We were, we're currently looking about two feet of snow outside. Right. Under, understandable. Understandable. No, but the, obviously BYU has had a great indoor volleyball tradition, and, uh, and, and no doubt that if, if you – were competing on the beach, BYU would, would feel a, a great team. What are some of the really memorable stadiums or arenas that you have seen throughout your career? You've obviously, like we said, been uh, to well, a lot of different yeah, places. That, that, is a, that is a fantastic question. Uh, well, I'm, I'm a little biased, but I would say my favorite football venue is LSU. There, there's really not anything that compares to Saturday night in Tiger Stadium. It just, it's really hard to compare that to anything uh, around the country. But I will say, you know, as you go around from a basketball perspective, BYU is right up there with anybody. It really is. Uh, I have gone there 
you know, obviously the last two years that I've been in the league, and the game presentation is top notch. It's right up again. I've been following that for for years, even going back to when I was at Marquette uh, with the the big sheet that comes down. Really the first school in the country from on the college side to do that and it just continues to get better and better so you know BYU is is right up there from a basketball perspective especially for a big game obviously uh, today you've got the big game coming up and um, it's a pretty pretty special place we certainly like to think so do you find that um, I mean I know our venue is maybe a little bit of an advantage because it's just bigger, but have you found that it's a huge shift from when you're playing other teams in the league to when you come here? Uh, yeah, I, I think it is because of the sheer size. Obviously, when you go to Gonzaga, uh, Gonzaga is a pretty special environment as well. From a basketball perspective, their basketball facilities are on par with anybody in the country. And so just first and foremost, they have that. But they, they obviously have great stream support as well. And, and then, you know, in the, in the rest of the league, uh, the, each venue is kind of unique. It, it, as you go around the league, and everybody, it's something everybody's trying to improve drastically throughout the league, which is a great thing. So, when were you at LSU? Were you rooting on LSU in the national championship game? Do you still have like you know your ties back <laughs> back to Louisiana? Yeah, you know. So the crazy part is, I actually the year that LSU lost to Alabama in the, the national championship game, uh, which would have been the the 2011 season 2012 was the championship but that particular season i actually accepted the job to go to the university of oregon the tuesday before lsu was playing against oregon in to kick off the season in dallas so here i am accepting the job to go to oregon but i'm still working at lsu needless to say that was probably the most interesting game i've been a part of uh, because it, I was really conflicted as to who I wanted to win. Uh, LSU ended up winning, which obviously propelled LSU to have a great season. If Oregon would have won that game, Oregon probably goes to the national championship that particular year because that was one of only two losses. So would have been would have been uh, pretty interesting. I, I guess I couldn't lose in that situation, but it, it made for an interesting game day. Well, for sure. And I'm not even sure if you can answer this question, but like, obviously, if you if you weren't the AD at, at LMU, let's just say. Do you have a sure. hometown team that you root for? Sure. Well, I'm originally from the state of Wisconsin. So from a, a professional sports standpoint, grew up as a, a huge, obviously, Brewers, Bucks, Packers. And I'm, I'm fortunate because maybe for the first time in my lifetime, all three are actually good at the same time, which is, is never happened. And uh, so that, I'm pretty happy about that. As far as college, obviously, growing up in Wisconsin – I do still kind of follow the University of Wisconsin, having worked at Marquette, uh, still follow Marquette. But I, I think when you work in college athletics, you end up following the teams of where, you, where you've where you been. So obviously my loyalties in college athletics are, are obviously first and foremost with LMU and then anybody else who's contributed to my retirement along the way, which would be <laughs> the University of Oregon, LSU, and Marquette, and, and Texas Pan American. Sure. Um, so, I mean – I guess getting back to where we were with LMU and BYU, what are you kind of expecting sure. from the game? Well, it should be should be a good game. Uh, you know, obviously BYU does a tremendous job and really starting to play well, which is, which I'm excited about. Uh, we should have a great crowd. Again, we always have a great crowd when BYU shows up, so that should be fun. The our, our team very young, and and so when you're young. And, and we've been missing three starters all year, uh, which has been been tough. So I think we're starting to finally play not like freshmen in, in some cases, and, and so that is exciting. And hopefully we can we can hang in there because right now the the WCC is playing at a, a great clip this season. You're looking at three uh, NCAA tournament teams, and, and that doesn't include USF, who's starting to come on a little bit. And so who knows? I mean, it, it could be – it's obviously a multiple-bid league, and that's a great thing about the WCC. It continues to get better. Yeah, we, uh, we've we talked about that a couple times on this program as far as, like, sometimes we're too big – we're mostly a two-bid league, and then sometimes a three, and that's kind of maybe what we're looking at this year. That's what we, we need BYU in the mix. <laughs> we would we love to be BYU. in the mix. We, we need BYU this year. We, that, then it becomes a three-bid league. Obviously, St. Mary's and, and Gonzaga have, have had – a great run here, and, and BYU obviously has been right up there 
um, consistently. So as long as we have those three teams playing, then then the challenge for everybody else in the league is really to continue to raise their level because there's no reason that this can't be down the road as as more schools in the league invest that it can't be a, a five or six bid league. Absolutely. What are you guys kind of really focused on as you look towards the end of the season and then going into the WCC tournament, which is obviously maybe, I mean, Gonzaga seems to always kind of dominate that conversation, but what sure. what are you guys focusing on as you're heading into that? What are your goals? Uh, continue to get better. You know, I, I think we, we want to continue to try to find ways to grow. And, and the great thing about Coach Dunlop is he has a growth mindset and, and really is focused on, on that and, and how, how do we get better? How do we get better each game every day? And then that will carry out over into next year and, and years beyond. Again, we only have one senior on the team this year, so that's pretty unique. Uh, and, and we actually have technically um, a, a senior that is redshirting this year and, and Matthias Markison, who had unfortunately had a family tragedy. So he's actually not on scholarship right now. He's withdrawn from school, redshirting. He'll be back next year, so we technically have a we'll have an entire team coming back, um, which is I don't know if I've ever been around that before. So that that's pretty exciting for us. Kind of the last question I'm going to throw at you. It's a little more fun. Is we saw a different color at the Marriott Center for Melanie this year. Talk to us about the new color yeah. scheme. Sure. So we we uh, we freshened it up a little bit as part of branding from the university. We're very fortunate. We have a, a president in President Snyder who really understands uh, marketing and, and really understands branding and, and really how that relates to the overall institution. And so the colors have brightened up. We've got a little bit lighter blue, a little bit brighter red, and those colors really pop. Uh, we've, we've done some renovations inside a Hurston Pavilion just from an aesthetic standpoint, and then we're, we're continuing to do more to the tune of just over $2 million in renovations. So we're, we're pretty excited about that. It's definitely made an impact and, and obviously having new logos, new colors, there's a lot that goes into that because all of a sudden you start walking around campus and realizing, wait a second, that's another spot that we didn't have on the original list that we need to change. So it's been, uh, it's been fun, but it's been a lot of work to try to make sure that the colors and, and branding and logos are all correct all over the place. Yeah, for sure. We, we understand that. We've got Navy and Royal and we, met, we play around with both. <laughs> But, uh, Craig, it has been a delight. Thank you so much for joining us on the Cougar Tailgate, and we wish you the best of luck, I mean, going forward into the WCC tournament. Absolutely, Sydney. Well, well, good luck. Uh, Obviously, we'll be rooting for the Cougs down the stretch, other than than Thursday. uh, Yeah, other than (laughs) Thursday. But we want it it for the WCC because the more teams that we get into the tournament, the better it is for the league and the better it is for uh, LMU. That was Craig Pintons, athletic director for Loyola Marymount University. When we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about the history of LMU basketball. Back into the Cougar Tailgate, I am Cole Wissinger. That over there is Sydney Carlson, and she just talked to Craig Pittens, the AD of LMU Athletics in general, uh, but also talking a little bit of basketball as well. Yeah, he's had a wild career, moved all over the country. Um, he was a joy to talk to. He's definitely settling into L.A., though. You can tell he's already in love with the beach and the weather. Imagine being able to enjoy yeah, the weather of what? Southern California. I tell you. I'm over it. I'm over the snow. I'm over it. I drove down Hot from take. Salt Lake a couple <laughs> days ago in a whiteout from in in between uh, where I was staying at right around the Bees Stadium and Lehigh. There were four different accidents on the side Super. of the road. Yeah. Driving into work on Wednesday, I believe it was, or maybe it was yesterday. Whenever it was, not mm-hmm. a single road that I drove on had been plowed at 9.30 in the morning. And I sense. had a moment where I was like, listen, if it's this bad when I leave, I'm going to just hunker down in the stadium and this is where I live now. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no need to go back. It's, nah, we're good. Know, there's no snow inside the Marriott Center. And that's good news for everyone that wants to go out and support the Cougars tonight Yep, against San Francisco. There you go. <laughs> it's nice like and that. warm. It's nice and warm there. <laughs> so we, we talk LMU, and when I think LMU, I think of... 
the I th- I think of just reckless scoring, and we didn't get into like the deep history of LMU basketball, and so we're going to do that right now, and we're going to kind of get there in a second because if I asked you who you think scores the most per game this year in the NCAA, you'd guess what? Like some of the top teams, right? Right. Like your Gonzagas. Yes. And Gonzaga, (laughs) here in the WCC, does happen to be that team. They also did it last year. They had a pretty impressive year last year as well. I Um, guess you could say that. (laughs) Scoring scoring somewhere in the 80s, right? Yeah, 88.5 in 2020 and 87.6 in 2019. What did I say? Did I say 2020? Yes. Great. Yes. And so those are the two. That's what Gonzaga's sitting at. Now, and those are impressive scoring numbers. If you score 88 in a game, you should be able to expect to win. Oh, absolutely. Um, LMU, in the late 80s and early 90s, the glory days of just not caring about defense, scored in 88, 110 points a game. Wow. In 89, 112 points a game. And in 1990, the glorious pinnacle year of this haphazard style of basketball 122.4 points a game average what if a team hit 122.4 in a game it would be on espn front page what's going on they were probably playing a division three opponent those those three seasons and and honestly lmu held the five highest combined scoring games in Division One history, like where both them and their opponent, sure. you, you tally up what the over-under would have been. Because, again, they were just running just, down yeah. and scoring. Eh, Who cares about defense? Defense optional. <laughs> right, 100%. Sounds kind of like an all-star game. So what's like the highest scoring game they had? I mean, you're, if you're averaging 122, there had to have been like an outlier that was insane. Oh, yeah. They, I mean, they had games uh, where they would score 181. What? In a victory. So, uh, well, we'll phrase it more fun. Uh, they allowed 150 points and still won. That is unreal. <laughs> that is truly unbelievable. Paul Westhead deserves his name mentioned because he is the coach that devised this just revolutionary style of basketball. And and you might think, oh, that sounds fun. But when push comes to shove, it's not actually going to get you wins. In 1990, this LMU team went to the Elite Eight. It's their best. When you look at the history of all of LMU, their glory years were right in this chunk. They went to the Elite Eight in 1990. In 1988, they went to the round of 32. Those were like the only couple years where LMU was advancing in the tournament in their whole history was in this chunk where they just scored. And and did they score? That seems like the most exhausting way to play basketball. You would get tired. I would be so tired. It's like, it would be like... A game of foosball where you're just like wildly like flipping <laughs> the handles and it's just shooting back and forth like, oh, my goodness. So anyone that complains about the this new revolution of the Houston Rockets where they just run up and score and, you know, James Harden doesn't bother playing defense. And yeah. just this past week, they 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 lined up their starting lineup, just didn't have a center. James Harden tried uh, taking the opening tip. <laughs> because they didn't have an actual big man. Uh, sure. Spoiler alert, JaVale McGee got it. Mm. Um, <laughs> Shocking. So anyone that's shocked by that style of play by Houston right now, go back and watch the sheer madness that was yeah, you have LMU, LMU to blame. in the 80s and the 90s. <laughs> Unreal. I would never have guessed that. Um, BYU, though. No stranger to scoring. No stranger to scoring. All right. We have a string of like top 10 scoring uh, like average scoring in the nation between 2010 and 2016. Now, if you had asked me before I saw these numbers to guess which year was the highest ranked well, team. Well, Jimmer was 2011. Jimmer, right. That's what you would think, but that's actually the lowest scoring in, through that stretch. So you've got, we were fifth in the nation in 2016, 83.2. We were seventh, though, Jimmer's senior year with 81.1 points per game. That's so weird. The highest was 2015. We were second in the nation, 82.1 points per game. And that was a year with Kyle Collinsworth, Tyler Hawes. It was a good basketball team. And And incidentally, the last team team that went to the NCAA tournament. Went to the NCAA tournament. So scoring does have some success. I mean, I guess you have to score points to win games. Yeah, sure. I suppose. (laughs) But But yeah, five years, 2010, 2011, 14, 15, and 16. 
that we were top 10 in scoring in the nation. It's nothing to turn your nose up at. BYU has been known for their scoring, and especially in the Dave Rose era, that that is something that they consistently hung their hat on. Uh, Coming up next, we have an interview where I sat down with Zach Selyus, and he kind of explains how Mark Pope has kind of melded two philosophies together where they've retained that scoring mentality, but also brought an attitude in general of defense to everyone. That's my conversation with Zach Selyus coming up next here on the Cougar Tailgate. Welcome back into the Cougar Tailgate. I am Cole Wissinger, and over there, Sydney Carlson. How are you doing? I am doing just great, Cole. How are you? I'm fantastic. <laughs> Super. I'm ready, and I'm ready for <laughs> BYU basketball. we got seven hours-ish, though, to wait before a game in the Marriott Center tonight against the San Francisco Dons. And while you are watching from a seat high up in the Marriott Center, hopefully, or on TV if you must, keep your eye open for a, for a 6-7 lanky white fellow with short shorts, highlights <laughs> in his hair, and a mustache, because that man is Zach Selyus, and he has a personality to match his eccentric look that he changes up for every year. I got to talk to Zach earlier this week. Here's that conversation. I remember freshman. Uh, Zach Sell, yes, as Greg <laughs> Bell would always call it. Draining threes. Now senior Zach Sellius is out there leading the team in rebounds. Could you kind of describe how your role has shifted over the years and, and kind of put some of your BYU career into perspective for us? Yeah, um, it's been a long journey. You know, it's been, it's kind of gone quick, but also looking back, it's been just a lot of ups and downs and things that kind of learned, um, but every year's been so different. It's been different coaches, different teammates. Um, it's been different roles that I've had, and it's been super fun because I've every year I've been a different position and I've done done different roles, and it's kind of created a whole new player that I've you know once was in high school, and it's made me into a different person that I know will help me grow as a person and a player when I play at the next level and try to go on and play, you know, professionally, if that's the career I take Mm -hmm. and it's going to help me do that. So it's been awesome being here at BYU and being able to learn from all these different coaches and to hopefully have this last year turn out the way that we want and to be able to be the best year possible so that, well, we can be the best now as the years to come. You certainly do bring versatility now to the table. I love hearing Mark Pope talk about you. What's it been like? Because uh, you you were with Dave Rose for the years before this. You you kind of you're one of the seniors on the team. Uh, describe for the people what Car- Coach Pope's style is with you guys. Um, Coach Pope is awesome. Um, it's just kind of crazy because Coach Pope was actually the one that recruited me to come to BYU. Oh no way! Yeah, when he was an assistant. Yeah. Player? All right. So that was like kind of the whole reason I came here. Because he was recruiting me, I was hyped with him, and you know, I came here, and I he was gone, so it was kind of disappointing. But I, Coach Rose was awesome. Mm-hmm. Like I loved Coach Rose, and you know he just had more of a style where it was very free. You know, we just kind of being able to score, run, and do all these things. And with that style, Coach Pope has that same kind of mentality, but it's more. You know, we got to do it all on defense. We got to. First, do it on defense, you know, get the stop, and then we can go. And both of those coaches, being able to play for both of them, has helped our team and the people that have played for Coach Rose and now Coach Pope has helped us be able to be you know, the team that we are because we have that mentality of scoring, but we also have the Coach Pope mentality on defense to be able to get stops and do all that. So it's awesome to have him. Everything's blending together. It's exactly. beautiful. Yeah. So you mentioned your recruiting process. Give the people a little bit of the backstory of Zach Selyus. What were you like in, as a high school shooter, and <laughs> how'd you get here to BYU? Um, I mean, I committed when I was a sophomore going into my junior year. Um, I was just kind of, you know, I was a point guard for my high school team, which is a lot You've different. come a long way. <laughs> yeah, so I was always grew up doing that and thought that's what, how I was going to be in college. You now it turned out different, which is totally fine. I loved it, but kind of my whole process going through AAU and everything, 
always Coach Pope was there. He was always coming, always recruiting me, always being a part, always kind of talking to me and my parents about, you know, how it's going to be in the future and everything. So I was so excited to come to BYU. And I had a sister who played here when I was little. So she played basketball here. And so I kind of have connections, you know, to BYU. And I just loved it and was super excited to come here. That's awesome. So uh, we're talking on a Wednesday right now, okay? And yeah. that means the last game that you've played was St. Mary's on Saturday. What was that environment like in the Marriott Center? It was incredible. You know, our fans are the greatest in the nation. They really are. The Rock is amazing. You know, our support uh, from our you know, boosters and everyone that comes to these games regularly and all of our fans that we've had for years – are so amazing you know they're always so loyal and we just have the best fan section I think in the entire country because they're always there they're always supportive no matter where we go there's always fans you know we go on the road to Portland this week and we know that there's going to be our fans there and then wherever we go there's going to be BYU fans so it's awesome to have that kind of environment even away from being in the Marriott Center and that St. Mary's game was the peak of it all. You know, they were there, they were loud, and it was awesome, and they definitely helped us get that win. Yeah, and you're not joshing, because sometimes you talk to the opposing coach, and they're like, oh, we can block it out. You know, these are these are adults. They don't, you know, fans aren't going to get in their head. But at least for, like, for you guys, you can feed off of that energy. Yeah, for sure. You know, that's that's when we all get the most hyped for the game is, you know, when we get a stop and the crowd's going crazy and – we get a couple buckets in a row, and that's when it goes wild, and you can't even hear the person next to you, and that's that's when it's fun. Great. Th- this is a radio interview. You've done TV before. Radio does you a disservice, Zach. Can you <laughs> please describe to the people what you look like so they can find you on the court? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm that that taller with highlights in my hair and the mullet and the mustache and look – ridiculous but uh-huh. yeah that's, so how, that's me how do you get that look like what what a because so I, i've had a mustache before right and but how why? <laughs> why why do you choose why do you why do you do what you do um every year it's been different you know i've had a new style every year and this year was my last year and had to go out with a bang you know and just nice. needed something to kind of spice it up and you know i Decided to go with the mustache, and you know, I put highlights in my hair for I have no idea what reason. And then all of a sudden, my mohawk became a mullet, and uh-huh. it's just the way it is. I mean, it works. Uh, yeah. I'm a fan. <laughs> all right, lighter. This is the lightning round time. So I've asked a couple of your, your teammates some of these questions as well. So Uh-oh. you'll kind of, these are the important ones, really. You ready? I think so. Okay. What's your favorite superhero? Uh, Iron Man. Easy. Good. What's your go-to Provo restaurant? Ooh, uh, probably Cubby's. See, that is that is the common answer. Yeah. I'm all right with that. Uh, last movie you saw in theaters? Oh, man. I saw Just Mercy was the last oh, one. Oh, shoot. That was, yeah, that's yeah. a good one. Uh, if, if basketball players had walk-up songs like in baseball, what would your jam be? Uh, mine would be Thunderstruck by ACDC. Good. So uh, the Iowa caucus is happening right now, and it's kind of created a stir on social media. There was a German television thing that highlighted Colorado and said that it was Iowa. And then someone else was like, ah, I bet you people can't even point to Iowa on a map. Uh, can you put point to Iowa on a map? Can you recognize Iowa? Of course. This is Iowa right up here. Folks, he is correct. Yeah, that's my mission. Oh, no way. Des Moines, Iowa. <laughs> that's perfect. Yeah. I didn't know that. Did you have fun? Was of it good, course. Good deal. I was the best. <laughs> oh, yes, every missionary <laughs> was the best. I think that's how it has to work. And then finally, we're now into February. Um, did you make New Year's resolutions? Were you successful on them? Uh, do you, you still working on them? Um, Are you a I goal mean, kind of guy, I guess? Yeah, uh, for okay. sure, for sure. Um, me and my wife had some goals that we've had to, you know, that we had as a couple, and we're still on this, that path, and we're still going strong, so... Good deal. Next week, who I talk to, I don't know who it's going to be yet, but I think I'm going to ask about Valentine's Day plans. We can get ahead of the game if, uh, you, do you know Do you know what you and your wife are doing for Valentine's Day? Something well, special? 
we are in California for our games on That's Valentine's true. Day. <laughs> so luckily she got a ticket and is coming out to watch the games. So awesome. that's our Valentine's Day is the game. Before uh, revealing his intimate Valentine's Day plans to us all, <laughs> Zach also showed off his geography knowledge, Sydney. And I want to give a little bit more explanation for what I was doing there. So German television this past week mm-hmm. was caught as they were trying to report on the Iowa caucus, not knowing which one Iowa is. Oh, no. Which for anyone that's, you know, coastal, the the, the big bad AP that I like talking about, <laughs> you know, you can understand if you, you mess up some things there in the middle. But they, I think they tagged as Colorado and had Colorado highlighted and said, this week in the Iowa caucus. Uh, that prompted later in this. So uh, then I brought that up to Zach Selyus. And then just yesterday on Twitter – Whereas Ohio was trending because some just random German dude ended up blowing up on Twitter, trending himself and going viral by labeling a blank map of the United States by knowing where California and Florida was. (laughs) And is this one Ohio? Is this one Ohio? (laughs) Is this one Ohio? I mean, listen, (laughs) I understand it. I understand it from a foreign perspective. They get a little jumbled in the middle. They all start to kind of just look like Cheerios. Like they're all just kind of, they're all just kind of Morpheus blobs. I get it. But maybe, maybe just pull out a map. We are living in the age of the internet. Sure. But then again, can you really blame the Germans when our, when our president also cannot particularly remember which state certain cities okay, are in. <laughs> but but in the defense of a man that I'm not sure if I've ever defended before, the city is called Kansas City. It sure is, but and it's there, in Missouri. And there is a Kansas City, Kansas. There is, there is, there is. It's just not where Arrowhead just Stadium Arrowhead sits. Just Arrowhead Stadium. Like, and here's my thing. Does he not have a team of people to help him out? He just, I just, I feel like every tweet, if you're the president, should run through a team of people before it ever gets out. There should be fact checkers. I think the allure of the man <laughs> is that it just happens. You're absolutely correct. And sometimes it contained. happens in a weird direction. <laughs> so, I mean, can you, Sidney Carlson, look at a map and tell me which one Iowa or Kansas or... Ohio I feel are pretty confident in a lot of those Midwestern states. Did you pass seventh grade geography? I did. Is the I, real question. I used to be able to name every country on a world map because I took an international relations class my freshman year of Hot college, dang. and every every like every quarter we would take. Um, a test, and she would pick ten random countries, and you had to locate them on a map, so you had to know where everything was. So I was really good at geography. All right. But those things start to fade from your brain, so I don't want to be too confident, but I feel <laughs> pretty good. There's there's a few that maybe get jumbled. Well, there's mm-hmm. a couple squares. I, I, I've I benefited from living next door now to Colorado yeah, because yeah. I think growing up, Colorado and Wyoming, they're, they're, they're slightly similar. different squares, but now that I've been to Colorado and Wyoming, I know which one is which. Like right. I-80 goes through Rock Springs and comes back down, whereas you got to go like the other way to get to Denver. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, the squares for me, I mean, growing up in Utah, the squares were always the easiest. It was like, pfft. Exactly where all these are. It's when you it's when you get to those coastal elite, <laughs> those coastal elite states. New England. So on on the the German man who Ooh, went viral, yeah. it just across all of New England, he said New Hampshire and Vermont. What is going on here? Right. <laughs> New Hampshire and Vermont are interchangeable to me. If they thought that finding Iowa was hard, the next pr- the first primary to come up is New Hampshire. Which one's New Hampshire? Ooh, good luck. Good luck, universe and world. Good luck finding New Hampshire. I'll give you a secret if if the world is listening right now. So there's two that kind of lock together. Right. They're like little triangles. Verm- but I... Vermont's triangle. Does it look like a V? Is the one that's the <gasps> V. You've just, the triangle you've going just up. changed my whole life. New Hampshire's triangle is the one going down. That's almost like an N. It's like a two thirds of an N. It, it is. There you go. Oh my goodness. It's that easy. I'm pretty sure that's what they were thinking when the founders in like the <laughs> 1600s, when New England was happening, were like you know divvying up space. They were like, if we're going to call this a couple Vermont, hundred years from now, let's make that one a V. <laughs> a couple hundred years from now, they're going to be two people sitting in a radio booth, and we're going to need to help them out. Not to mention the Germans that are going to be looking for the, for the states. 
that really has blown my mind, but it has forever changed me. There you go. You'll never forget now. I'll never forget now. <laughs> and do not forget to come to BYU Basketball tonight. I'll say it one more time <laughs> that I am the best at segues on this show and also that BYU plays the San Francisco Dons. Tip-off is at 7.30 Mountain Time. So get in your seat early. Be loud. Uh, athletics, are we doing anything fun for the game tonight to, to get the folks in the seats? Any fun tossing t-shirts into the stands or there little mini will basketballs be a money gun actually oh my that's you better than chance, t-shirts yeah you have the chance to be a recipient of a money gun that shoots out seven bills per second i believe wow anyway i'm excited Is to see legal? how it goes Shh. <laughs> We're on the air call. Okay. Of course it's legal. It's a giant cannon of money. (laughs) It should be. This is America. This is America. So you can get some free money and you can also see what is sure to be an amazing game. We are hoping for, you know, a 50-point win. But it'll probably be close and it'll probably be exciting. And the Cougars will probably need you. As Zach Selyus said, fan interaction matters. And so come out and support the BYU Cougars. Sure to be an amazing game. And that does that wraps us up here on the Cougar Tailgate. One more Saturday in the books. We're a production of BYU Radio. My name is Cole Wissinger, and that over there is Sydney Carlson. You can catch us every Saturday at 12 o'clock Mountain Time, which is 2 p.m. Eastern and 11 Pacific on BYU Radio. You can catch the podcast wherever you do go to your podcast, uh, whatever your preferred platform is, whether it's Google Play or iTunes or Stitcher. Also, every time on BYU Radio, you can go back and check out our archive. Go back and listen to some of those football shows if you're pining for football, if it's been a little bit too long there. Listen to what we've had to say about basketball through the weeks. All of our episodes are archived at BYUradio.com. Go Cougs! Go Cougs!